This is the Cliff Yates Show. Personal growth, motivation, inspiration, and philosophies for a great life. Hey, everybody. This is the Cliff Yates Show. I'm really excited about today's guest. We talked a little bit off camera, and uh, he's a uh, study uh, studier of, uh, well, he's, he's in his doctoral program for psychology and a criminal justice, I believe, either major or, well, we're going to find out, but he's, he's uh, studied psychology, criminal justice, and we found out some other things uh, that we have in common, which is just kind of freaky, but let me bring him right on today. Mr. Joel Bouchard, thanks for joining me, my brother. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. So interesting, just by chance, you know, and I have a book called Deputy where I talk about my first five years in, in law enforcement, which was in Geneseo, New York, which is very upstate New York, which is very rural, as you know. And then uh, we got connected here through Podmatch. And then now I find out you really are in a little small town that was kind of, uh, it's the next county over from Livingston County, right? Yeah, yeah, Geneseo, New York's where I do my grocery shopping. So what? Oh, my close. goodness. That is so <laughs> great. The fountain, the famous fountain in Geneseo, New York, the Geneseo College, and I still have my uh, cousins are living there in Geneseo. Wow, that is so cool. I, people just don't know how, uh, how what's a small world for that to be. I saw that on your bio and I go, that can't be the same Perry, New York, near where I used to work as a deputy sheriff and grew up. So that's so cool. Yeah, the same one, which, you know, based off of population is uh, quite the coincidence. Yeah, it's kind of uh, it really can't happen. But uh, what uh, and you mentioned criminal justice. What's your connection with criminal justice? Uh, not much, really. Um, I, I got an associate's degree in criminal justice at GCC, which I'm sure oh. you heard of. Yes, of um, course. So that was sort of my, yeah, that was my foray into higher education. Um, and then later on in, in life decided that that wasn't the, the route I wanted to go. So uh, my educational journey has kind of taken me all over the map, um, which, you know, that's just kind of the person that I am. I've got a lot of different interests, a lot of different hobbies. And so I'm always glad to be studying something new, doing something new. Yeah, I'm I'm in the, I'm the same way. So you yeah you graduated from GCC Genesee Community College, and that's I have a good friend. He actually he he retired from the uh, Genesee County Sheriff's Department, and then I had a friend who worked in Leroy, New York, for Leroy PD. You probably know that little town. And then he he ended up going to the Batavia Fire Department, and he, he still has a uh, he still has a restaurant there in in uh, in uh, Batavia. So that is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So, and then now your degrees in psychology, you're studying to be, uh, you know, your doctorate degree in psychology. Where, where do you go for that? Uh, so that's online. That's through okay. um, Liberty University. Okay. Um, so yeah. yeah, I've, I've got a lot of, a lot of balls in the air. So I, I just do that one online. Kind of saves me some time. Yeah. I'm, God, I'm, I'm like, you sound like you're the same as me. I have too many you know, people will tell, well, you should concentrate on one thing, but I really, you know, none of us are really one thing, right? And so do you have any special, special interest in psychology, a specific, a specific form of study or? Yeah. So as somebody who's interested in philosophy, um, the questions that I like in psychology are the ones that um, people tend to shy away from a little bit. So first off, there's two kinds of psychologists, really. There's people that, um, you know, uh, tend towards helping people solve their problems, you know, uh, do counseling and therapy, that sort of stuff. And then there's research psychologists, people who study brain scans and yeah. know, experiments and that type of thing. So that's that's the, the avenue I am go working towards. And, uh, you know, it, it, in that way, it's a, it's a lot safer to stick to things that are easy to prove and easy to measure. Um, but I like the big things. So I like consciousness, right? And I like, yeah. uh, you know, some of the, some of the the bigger topics and you know it it's hard to study um but i think that that's what makes it fun yeah did you, have you studied any uh well you know they say that there was a well, god is it is it uh cognitive behavioral therapy that a lot of that comes from like stoicism or the similar kind of thinking yeah yeah you can see a lot of roots of philosophy in psychology um you know, and yeah, stoicism is uh, a lot of the things you see in cognitive behavioral therapy are related to stoicism or, um, you know, even even Zen Buddhism and stoicism kind of share a lot of similarities and roots and things that kind of bleed through 
um, in terms of helping people help themselves by reframing yes. their perspectives. You know? Reframing. So interesting, you know, because I studied a lot of, uh, how about NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming? Have you studied that at all? Or? No, I have not. Yeah, but you've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. And language, again, is another one of the most fascinating yeah. parts of psychology that leads into philosophy, you know, especially when you, you know, as a as a philosophy-minded person, you start thinking back into the history of humanity and how things developed and how the brain is sort of structured and wired for it uh, becomes a really fascinating point of discussion. Yeah, so, yeah, those so the two guys, kind of, I'm going to remember, John Grinder is one of them. And then there's another guy, one was a computer kind of guy and one was a language guy. And they got together and they really started to model what some of these th therapists were doing. I, I, Satir might have been one of them. And uh, Erickson was another another one, was an older psychologist. And they were, so instead of uh, kind of modeling things that were meant to uh, fix people's wrongful thinking, it was really... A, a more way of modeling excellence and maybe to get to get to the next level of you know studying success and not not to fix that something was wrong but maybe improve just improve our life you know on a general purpose not that anything was broken yeah and that's um it's it that's an interesting thing that you see shared i was just on another podcast the other day and um uh the guy was quizzing me on um sort <laughs> quizzing. of differences in <laughs> Right. Yeah. Differences in theologies around the world and things. Yeah. And um, one thing I was telling you is that you can sort of, with a lot of theologies and philosophies around the world, you can sort of split them into two groups. Um, one group that says, um, you know, in order to become a better human being, you have to, you know, you have to better yourself. You have to work towards things. You have to have a, a virtuous life and these sorts of things. And then there's other philosophies and theologies that say um, that, hey, you know, there's, you already have this good thing, but you sort of have to, uncover all of the stuff that's covering it up right so it's sort of a additive or subtractive right and i think a lot of psychology theories sort of follow similar principles right there's some that you know and sort of insist on hard work and, and building up skills in order to deal with some of the uh, weaknesses and problems you might have and there's other ones that aim to identify um the sort of added meaning that you've given things that that isn't really there um or uh you know, it, it's kind of that negative space that you go, okay, well, if I reframe this perspective, then this situation, I realize yeah. I've given it much more uh, importance than it, than it needed. So yeah, kind of an interesting parallel. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I love about NLP is they, so they have about five presuppositions, right? That they presuppose you, you act as though these presuppositions actually are true. So a couple of them might be, you know, the past does not equal the future. Uh, the map is not the territory. So the map, you know, people are not broken, really. It's just their map of the world is because they see the world a certain way, but that doesn't mean that it's close to reality, right? So their map is, you know, just like a regular map says the gas station's here, this is, is there, and then when you get to the actual territory, that place isn't even there. So And so some people are way off, right, on their map of how things are. And another presupposition is that people, and I find this so true, and let, let me know what you think about this. People respond to perception, not reality, right? Or perception is their reality. So they they respond to how they perceive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That was another thing. This this other podcast I was on, it was it was sort of a deep philosophy podcast. And he was asking yeah. me about that. He goes, Do you think that do you think that people make reality? And I said, uh, it's a mix, right? I think it's a right. mix of both. I think that there is there is an objective reality out there, right? You can reach out and touch things and you can perceive things and whatnot. Um, but if you sort of take 100 different people and observe the same thing, you'll get 100 distinct answers on what it is, right? And so it's kind of like triangulating knowledge, right? If yeah. you put everybody's opinion together, you figure out what something is, but everybody's going to see it a little bit differently. And that nuanced way in which you perceive things um, is your reality. Right. right. So your reality is going to differ from other people's um, and it will share some things in common. 
Um, but the example I brought up there was in was blind sight, right? If you have um, a problem with uh, a, a part of your brain, but your visual system is still intact, um, and you ask this person, hey, where's the light? They'll say, well, I'm blind. I can't see it. And you say, just guess. And they always point to the light. And if hmm. you say, I'm going to hand you an object, hold your hands out, they'll always hold their hands out in the shape and size of the object that needs to be held. Because the visual system is intact and it's actually sending information to the brain. Yes, the, the brain, brain the is brain still brain getting that information. Oh my God, okay. Yeah, yeah, but it just can't identify it or, or mediate it. So right. the reality versus the perception, um, it, there's a disconnect there. Right. And we all have it. We all have biases. We all have um, perceptual issues and whatnot, but just some of them are more extreme than others. And I always like using that as an example. Yeah, that's right. You know, and NLP has these same things where they try to tell you to, you know, kind of pull back in your observation to, because we're seeing this, I'm seeing you from my perspective, but then if I can visualize uh, the view from you, what you're seeing, I can, and I can take that in. And then from a third spot right to see it from a distance from above you know just dis disconnect and also yeah another thing that, that nlp does so you know when people are really haunted by these memories they can actually change that memory in other words instead of seeing it associated they call it in other words i'm experiencing that thing to disassociate it now see it from a little bit farther away change the voices how you remember it and keep repeating that and you can actually change you know, and change the memory is not going to have such a, a, a uh, monumental effect on your psyche. Yeah, that's the interesting thing about the structure of the human brain is that um, your memory recall system um, yeah. comes through the same area of your brain that learning occurs in your hippocampus. So yeah. um, people like to think of their memories as these sort of concrete, accurate things. But every time you recall a memory, um, you it's sort of like taking something out of the cupboard and putting it back into the cupboard. Um, but every time you do it, it changes subtly. Right? Yes. You're either taking something out or adding something in. And so the more you, you mess with this memory, the more it actually changes. Yes. And uh, it's not a, not nearly as stable or as accurate as you think. And so sometimes that can be harmful, right? If you uh, misremember something on a witness stand or yes. you misremember something when you're having an argument with your spouse, right? But sometimes it can be good, right? PTSD patients and, uh, you know, p other people who have experienced trauma, you can kind of go in and manipulate some of these things to uh, sort of shake that that fear that has taken hold of their, their whole life, you know? Yeah, and, you know, Tony Robbins would talk about this kind of as a, uh, he called it neuroassociative conditioning, but, uh, yeah, so he would, he would talk about, creating these memories that are causing such a problem that happened so long ago, you know, change that memory, you know, make the voice like a Mickey Mouse or change it and keep remembering it that way. And after a while, you know, you'll start laughing at this thing that used to create such trauma in your mind now seems silly. And so uh, that that's kind of an interesting way that we can actually change the memory. As you said, as you keep pulling that out, it changes in, in ways and we can actually manipulate it that ourselves take control of that memory yourself and, and and change it so that it's not so brightly colored it's not so big maybe we can make it smaller we can make it black and white right yeah yeah so it's a perfect uh demonstration that um you do have some control over yeah. your reality right over what you perceive the world to be and so with that newfound power um it's good to go out and make the world part partly how you want it to be yeah that is so true and, and i don't know i was reading the philosophy today that it was you know it has you know we don't we don't get upset by anything that happens we are only upset by our judgment of it right yeah yeah and a lot of stoics have have quotes that that say something similar to that you know yeah or really or, or Seneca yeah or, these other guys, every, they all seem to have some flavor of, of that quote. And it's true, right? I mean, it is, um, yeah. you know, there's, and, and again, it's uh, something that's sort of paralleled in Zen. Um, and there's a lot yeah. of stories there that go go about it. But I remember um, the yeah. one that sticks out in my mind is there's, they had this sort of marauding warlord that was conquering the whole countryside. And he went to take over the uh, the Zen dojo and he's, you know, the, the master didn't move. He said, hey, 
you know, you should acknowledge me. Don't you know I'm the kind of guy that can run you through with a sword without blinking? And the master said, don't you know I'm the kind of guy that can be run through with a sword without blinking? And you go, yeah, yeah you know, that's what you want. You want to be the kind of person who it doesn't matter what happens, right? You're always going to, you know, maintain a, a level head and, and uh, control over your own your own emotions, your own thoughts about how yeah. things are going. But, yeah, that changed uh, me. That's what I, think. I I got on the personal development, really psychology kind of bandwagon, personal growth stuff like 40 years ago. I had kind of been into a negative place. I went to a Jim Rohn seminar and then I changed a few things, went to a Tony Robbins seminar, walked the coals. And, you know, and then, uh, you know, when I changed, things began to change for me. And then, man, all of a sudden I realized, wow, this self-power is uh it's not anybody out there it's an inside job and i just got became fascinated with it and a lot of it was the study of psychology but really a lot of it was philosophy and they kind of interconnect you know the brain and the mind but it goes together with the body right yeah no absolutely um that's a huge part of it if i moved my camera a little bit to the left here you'd see that i've, I've got my gym inside my studio um so yeah, keeping, you know, you there is no mind without a body, right? Yeah. So I think that living a healthy lifestyle is 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 paramount, right? You know. So yeah, I hit the weights, I run, I I do all that stuff. Um but yeah, on on top of that, uh sort of what you were saying about psychology and and philosophy there. Uh you know, that's it even your approach to those, right? Not just studying philosophy isn't guaranteed to get you where you want to be, right? Because right. you could yeah. end up identifying with existential philosophers, right? Right. And deciding yeah. that there's no meaning in life and everything is terrible, right? <laughs> so you yeah. can go to some dark places. And, and a lot of philosophers were these kinds of, they, they um, were. Sort of dark, depressed people. Yeah. But the ones who aren't, right, are the ones who identify with what we were saying earlier, right? The question isn't so much what is the meaning of life as what is the meaning of my life, right? And when you do that, you sort of take some control of it and you're, you're empowered to, to live yeah. how you want it. You know? Oh, my goodness. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah, I was a, uh, I'm a Christian. So I thought, wow, oh, God, I'm studying the word. I'm into the Bible. And then I go, oh, maybe I shouldn't be studying philosophy because it's not really Christian. And then I was reading Thomas Aquinas, of course, and he loved Aristotle, and he was attacked, right, for following a philosopher. And, uh, you know, he, he, he stood tall and he said, hey, you know, all, uh, all truth is God's truth. So, you know, these philosophers said a lot of truth. And, uh, and so he didn't care where he got it from. He, he liked to study thinking and the mind. And, and so then I felt free to, oh, I'm, it's okay, you know, <laughs> kind of weird. Yeah, yeah, my... My dad was a pastor. Um, what? But oh my God! He was always, yeah, he was always looking at some some different uh, philosophical and, and religious texts. And you know, the way he always explained it to me growing up was, um, you know, how do you know what you believe if you don't know what anybody else believes? Right. That's then right. You're just you're oh. just you're just doing what you're you're told. You know, and that's that's kind of a dangerous place to be. As a matter of yes. fact, I think it's part of you know the most dangerous part of the the current state of of the country. Yeah. So, you know, being exposed to other other viewpoints and, and studying other things, um, it's not threatening to your belief system. You can reinforce your beliefs by exposing yourself to other beliefs. Um, yeah. And it helps you have some understanding for some other people. Right. I would never um, I would never bash anybody for their religious beliefs, um, largely because religious beliefs are mostly metaphysical in nature, meaning they're outside the purview of science or uh, epistemological certainty. So who am I to, to judge yeah. know, what somebody believes? Right. Um, so yeah, you know, it's, I think that exposure to the widest amount of, of viewpoints possible and, and thinking yeah. about them, you know, beyond a surface level, you know, think about them critically and thinking about your own beliefs critically and sort of situating them as an, is an important part of, of having a healthy yes. uh, spiritual life. It's so true. Yeah, man, that's, that's a, man, that's awesome. Yeah, it's so important. If I, I can't imagine what it, because you know where I used to police in, in upstate New York. I mean, it was such a rural area. I mean, I, we had 22 deputies. So when I went from there to the L.A. County Sheriff's Department with uh, 10,000 deputies, when I went from working Geneseo to working Compton, you know, to gunfire every night, to live, seeing how gangs operate and to seeing, 
you know, these gang shootings and these warlords and how they ran the streets and how people were pulling hits in the L.A. County jail and how they would do that and run drugs in there. I mean, being exposed and then going to West Hollywood and seeing, you know, the gay community and how this city really, you know, was in a different culture and how we would police that culture and how we had to adapt to that and and then working at Universal, you know, so being exposed to all these different cultures and then working, you know, in Calabasas, you know, adjacent to Malibu and just, you know, for going from one, you know, I would work in the ghetto area and I would think, my God, I'm living like a king. And then I would work Malibu area and think, man, I'm poor. You know, the, the, the dichotomy was just amazing, you know? Yeah. And I mean, that's it's a good example, right? Um, you can follow the same laws, but you'd probably police a little differently in each one of those areas, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think that that's the way people should sort of approach studying religious and philosophical um, text, right? You can believe in in a um, you know a concrete truth, an objective truth, um, you know, and what what what's out there. But when you're approaching different viewpoints, um, you sort of have to subtly shift your perspective. You have to think about you know what what is going on within the context of what it is you're studying in order to really understand it and know at that point if it's something you do or don't adhere to. Yeah, man, that's so true. And, and I gotta I gotta address this because you're so amazing. You got so many interests and. You know, I've done so many different things, too. And sometimes people say, why you're doing what now? But now so I see you're also a musician on top of everything else. So what instruments do you play? I see a lot of guitars there. I see electric. I see acoustic, uh, all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I play guitar, bass and drums mainly. I also wow. play some keyboard. And then behind me, I've got a ukulele, a mandolin and a, a dulcimer. So um. Yeah, I got a recording studio here where I do my podcast as well as um, I record all the different instruments, put them together, and then I release albums online. So if you're interested in listening to them, anywhere you listen to music, you can just type in my name and you'll you'll find some albums. But, all right, I'm going to put all your links in the uh, podcast show notes and also on the YouTube uh, description. So I'll send people to your music. What kind of music do you play? Uh, it's It's alternative rock, yeah. Okay. And uh, so when when did you learn how to play all these instruments? When you were very young or did you take up any of these when you were older? Uh, it sort of depends on your definition, right? Um, I didn't I didn't play anything until I was a teenager. Um, and then it was just me and, and a couple of my buddies. And it was the most teenage boy thing ever. We said, hey, let's let's start a band. None of us play any instruments. So you'll be drums and you'll be bass. And so yeah. I got guitar. We all taught ourselves how to play. We started playing a little bit locally. We did some battles with the bands and things. And then my drummer got married really young and my bass player moved out of state to go to college. And I thought, man, I'm just starting to get into music. I don't really want to stop. And so I took my life savings as a 18 year old down to Guitar Center and I bought all the equipment, everything. And I said, I'm just going to figure this out. Right. And, you know, now God here. bless you. Yeah. What, uh, so let me ask you, because I was, I was researching, because I always wanted to play piano, but then oh, I like to play guitar, and then, so as an older person, although I feel 25, it's funny, I talk to people, right, and I, I think I'm their age, and I realize, oh shit, I'm 66, right, and they're 40, you know what I mean? So I, I, I just don't operate in that mindset of, you know, I think, you know, in my mind, I could start a whole new career, and I think, oh no, I can't do that, I don't have 30 more years. But uh, so what interest, what would you suggest that I start playing? What would be the easiest to, to learn as an older person? This is my question to you, Joel. Yeah, I'd say if if you've got a pretty good sense of rhythm and you've got some good coordination, drums would be the easiest to learn. Um, if you want to do something more melodic, um, my favorite instrument to play is the bass guitar. Um, you can, it's a pretty easy transition between guitar and bass. Um, but if you start with bass, then you at least learn where all the notes are on the fretboard. Ah. You don't have to worry about chords. Uh, okay. The strings are a little bit farther apart, so it's easier to push them down and not hit the wrong note, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so, yeah, bass is a good place to start if you want to learn how to play some songs and stuff. And then, like I said, it's a good foundation for picking up guitar a little bit later if you want to. Oh, okay. That's good advice. All right. Do you play? You play keyboard, though, right? You play piano? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. The only reason I would do that is because, you know, you can get the keyboard and you can put headphones to it and you don't bother anybody while you're practicing, right? That's the only thing I like about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, 
So how good yeah, is that? Stuff is, is, is it? Go ahead. Oh, all your stuff, oh, all is, my headphones? stuff is electronic. So I, yeah, I can plug it right into the computer and, and put the headphones on. So I'm not bugging anybody, but I started, loud, uh, but. I started playing tennis at 60 and I love it. And then I've really recently found out that I, you know, how good it is for not just the body, but the brain. So the music's the same way, right? Because you really, how, how good is that in your, for brain function? It's really one of the best things you can do. They tell you, uh, you know, if, if you, if you're young, learn a language. Um, but and, and if you're old, you can learn a language, but you're not going to know it fluently if you're more than 12 years old. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, learning a language and learning an instrument are, are top of the top of the, the chain as far as things that are good for your brain. Of course, any sport is good. And, and tennis is a, yeah. a very good one because not only is it, you know, cardiovascular, but you also um, have a lot of quick reflex. Um, yeah. You know, quick reflexes are needed and that's important for keeping mental function sharp as well. So. Yeah. You know, I always, I think because, so you are constantly, your body, I mean, amazingly, your brain is instantaneously computing all the time, direction, speed, spin of the wall, ball, anticipation to where it's going to be and moving your body parts to where it's going to be and then your ability to strike the ball accurately in a directional place. I mean, I, I, there's a lot going on there, not just physically, but mentally. It's, it's crazy good. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, so much of that stuff is subconscious, right? You don't yeah. consciously think about it because you don't have time to. And so you develop these these sort of quick twitch um, skills that, that tend to decline with age a little bit. Yeah. You sort of keep things sharp by exercising that way. Hey, what's your, uh, have you done any in-depth study on the subconscious mind? No, not, not too much. So, um, I, where I'm at with my PhD is I haven't gotten into the dissertation stuff, so I don't have any, um, yeah. specific thing that I've studied. I'm still doing classes. Um, it'll probably be sometime next year when I'll start getting into the dissertation, but, um, okay. and that's, a, that's the unfortunate thing, right? Is that, uh, the subconscious, uh, you know, they'll, they'll look at it some in biological basis of behavior and things. Um, but in terms of like, uh, you know, thinking about it analytically, it's sort of passe, you know, they go, Oh, well, you know, Freud and Jung, like we don't really talk about them anymore. So we're, we're going to kind of ignore it. So it's not covered as much in the curriculum as it, as it used to be. But Yeah. I, I read, I read a guy over and over again, Dr. Joseph Murphy on the power of the subconscious mind. I became fascinated by it because, of course, I'm sure it's just coincidence, Joel. But, you know, in 19, I think it was 83 or 4, you know, I had done stand-up comedy, you know, for my class, just, you know, uh, not really knowing that you could write your own material or, or you're supposed to. And so I would just copy other people that I would see on TV and then I would do it in front of the class. And so I, rem I was a deputy at Livingston County. So it was probably 84-ish. I don't know. So, uh, oh my God, uh, I'm trying to think of, oh, who's the comedian? He, he lit himself on fire. Do you know I'm talking about the black comedian? He, he was, uh, no, no, I'm not sure. Oh my God. I forgot his, his name. He's one of the greats, but he did, he, he did, uh, I'm, I'm looking at him right now. Damn it. But anyways, he did a show called live on the sunset strip. I'll think of his name. But I saw the DVD live on the Sunset Strip, and I'm watching this, and I and I loved the way the stage looked. And right, so man, where is this place that they they filmed this? I keep seeing the. I, I'm looking at the comedian, anyway. And, and so I looked, and it was fil it was filmed at the Hollywood Palladium. This is 1983, 84, and so I'm thinking, man, oh, I would love to do a show. I got to do. I'm going to do a show someday at the Hollywood Palladium. Never knowing how would I ever get to L.A., how would I ever get to this Hollywood Palladium. But I always have, have that in my mind. Richard Pryor, live on the Sunset Strip. So okay. how would that ever happen? I have no idea. But I always put that in my mind because I would watch it over and over again and think, look at that stage. I'd like to be on that stage. Hollywood Palladium. So, you know, so in 1980, you know, so, so 83. No, I'm sorry. So that would have been about 79 or 80. So in 1983, I ended up going out to the L.A. County Sheriff's Department, 
working in the jail, getting disgruntled by being in the jail. And then I take a comedy course. Oh, this is how you write stand up. And then I start doing stand up comedy. And so then around 96, I do my own show at the at the uh, Roxy on Sunset. You know, and that went well. I produced my own show. I rented the theater out and everything else. And so I'm driving down Sunset, and then I go by, oh, my God, there's the Hollywood Palladium right there, right, Joel? And so, man, I wonder what it would take to rent this place, you know? So I go in, I talk to the owner, and it was one of 12 owners, but he was a, a reserve police officer. And he goes, well, to rent this place, you know, during the week, it would be $5,500, and then you got to get a million-dollar insurance policy, and you got to provide the lights and the sound. So I had tax money or whatever. Anyways, I just, I made a contract right there with them for like five months later to do, to rent out the Hollywood Palladium. And so the, uh, so a few days later, he contacts me. He goes, oh, uh, Paramount Pictures is doing the re-release of Grease and they wanted your night at the Palladium. And I told them, I already have a contract with you, but they're willing to pay you 5,000 to change your date. And I don't know why I said this, Joel. I didn't even think about it. And I go, well, I've done a lot of advertising. Uh, it'll, t- it'll cost them 9,000. And so he ended up contacting them. But they, anyways, they paid me 9,000 to change my date. And so we did a big show at the Hollywood Palladium. But how did that come to be, Joel? I planted that in my subconscious mind and then things just happened by coincidence or not? Yeah, you know, I think that um, it comes back to what we were saying at the beginning, right? Is, you know that we we make our reality in some ways and so yeah you know it's similar to me with with music right nobody ever taught me how to play the instruments nobody taught me how to build a computer nobody taught That's me right. how to oh. mix or, or do any of that stuff so it's really you know if you put your mind you put your mind to something you can you can make a lot more happen than what you think right there is an outside world that presents obstacles and yeah. um, certainly, you know, not anything is, is possible, but a lot more is possible than what people think. Right. And uh, I think that that that's a real good example of it. Do you think having a because this comes from uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, right? It, having a dominating thought in your mind that you connect with strong emotions, that that puts things into work uh, to make that happen? Yes, yeah, certainly. You know, within an individual psychology Absolutely. Um, and then you can even make a case, right, that if that is um, sort of your dominant motivation, that it can be something that can be picked up on by by other people around you. Oh, ah, yeah, so, there is. Yeah. I think there's something to be said for that, too. You know, a, a sincerity and a drive um, and, a, and a competence uh, that, that people will pick up on. And, uh, you know, I <laughs> one that's kind of funny, right, is uh, there was a, an art thief. Uh, who ended up stealing hundreds of paintings just by walking into museums and picking the paintings up off the wall and walking out. And he just did it confidently enough that nobody stopped him hundreds of times, you know. Um, So, yeah, I think that, you know, there's something to be said about that, right? If you have a motivation, you have a drive, you have some competence, uh, then then people can pick up on that kind of thing. Wow. Now, have you ever heard of Emile Coué? He was a psychologist or psychotherapist in England. In the 1800s, you ever hear of him? I've heard of him. Yeah, he has a book. You know, the power of auto suggestion. He, cl- I mean, he claims if you read his book, you should read it as a psychology. Emil Coué, and so Tony Robbins used a lot of what he said. So he would use these incantations that he would have people say, you know, 25 times, you know, at night before they went to bed in that kind of sleepy state, and then in the morning. So he would have them repeat you know, every day, 25 times, every day in every way, I'm getting better and better every day in every way I'm getting better and better. And he said, these people, I mean, they, they were healing themselves through these incantations. Yeah, no, I, you know, I believe that there's, there's something to it, you know, yeah. I think that that's, that's what we're talking about, right? Is that we have the power to, to change our own yes. reality in, in some ways. Um, and that's not to at all make light of, um, s- you know, certain serious conditions people have or certain serious obstacles that, that life puts in our way. Um, but I think that we're, we're much too quick to uh, let those things trip us up. You know, I think that in most, yeah. in many cases, right, a lot of us are quitting too early or putting too much of a negative spin on something yeah. you know, when it doesn't exist. So. It, yeah, it's good to hear inspiring stories of people. Um, I can I, I can tell saying, you, right? you know, you're a, I, 
you know, I, you're kind of the, the template for where I want to be in 30 years, right? Somebody who, because that's the way I Thank feel you. now, right? Yeah. I feel, yeah. you know, yeah, every day I want to, I want to do something new. I want to learn something new. I yeah. want to be engaged in something new. And, um, and that age is just kind of a number, right? Just something that's out yeah. there, but it's not, it's not, you know, a, a definition of who you are. Yeah. I just interviewed a guy named John Brink in Canada. He is, uh, he's probably, he, at the time he was training for his next bodybuilding contest. He was 84. I mean, the guy's just full of life, <laughs> man, and just crazy, inspiring. He's got several books out. He, he sent a couple to me and my mom and, and, uh, yeah. Oh God. I, I, was, I was going somewhere else right before I saw that in, uh, in LA, I saw it in actual, the power of the belief, right? So, I mean, several times we had offices were shot and they ended up dying through shock or whatever. But I mean, in the end, the doctor would, you know, the doctor said on several of these occasions, these were not, these were not life threatening injuries. These were not death injuries. A lot of police officers would get shot and think, Oh my God, I'm shot. I'm going to die. And these gang members, I saw them all the time. They were shot up right and left. They, they saw so many instances of their friends being shot and surviving. They automatically shot. They, they, that's part of their culture. We're going to get shot and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna move on. And, and so they would survive because their mindset was not, I'm shot, I'm going to die. Their mindset was, this is part of the game. And so and that was kind of a real life thing that I saw in real life. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's some science behind that. Um, there's cases of perfectly healthy people dropping dead. They call it, you know, um, broken heart syndrome. Yeah. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. Sort of technically, what it is. Right? Yeah. You you reach a point where you don't realize that you know your thoughts aren't just these things that are sort of floating in an immaterial plane, right? Your thoughts are you know electrochemical signals that are being sent through your body. And those stress hormones and the the, the depression and the, you know all, everything that filters through sends messages to the other tissues in your body. And if it's severe enough, you can drop dead from it, right? Absolutely. So that's what negative emotions can do. You can imagine what positive emotions can do, and you know what endorphins can do through exercise, and what dopamine can do through learning. And so, yeah, it's very important, you know, to have a mindset that's geared yeah. towards growth and geared towards positivity. Yeah, I mean, that's so, I mean, it's so obvious. There's been too many studies on it. People can do it themselves. If you know these thoughts have such a negative or can have such a negative effect on your health and your body and your cells that you, I mean, just, you know, if you don't feel positive, fake it just to keep yourself healthy. I mean, that's what you get things like worried sick, right? Because you can actually make yourself sick by these thoughts, right? That you keep putting in your head. And in the same way, positive thoughts, you know, can give you these endorphins. And, and, I mean, and you can, you know, Tony Robbins, and I find it so, so true, right? He has like three, three things you can do if you want to change your state of mind, right? First, change your physiology, right? Motion affects emotion. Change the way you're moving. Change your focus, what you're focusing on. And number three, change what you're saying to yourself. And, and every time you can change your state uh, to a more positive one. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if, and those things, um, you know, they're simple if you, if you get into a routine, um, but they're very powerful, but even something, what, what I think of as like the dumbest experiment in psychology, right? They, they had these people, um, take a, take a, um, like a mood questionnaire and the one group they had put a pencil between their teeth while they were filling out the exam. And what that did is it forced them to smile, you know, ah, uh, yeah, this yeah. between your teeth. And then there's another group, and I forget what they made them put in their mouth, but it made them frown in order to hold the thing in their mouth. And what they found is, you know, over and over again, the people who had the pencil in their teeth rated themselves as being much, much happier, right? So just smiling, just the act of smiling, um, even people who aren't aware of it, right, uh, it makes you makes you happier, right? <laughs> so we're always com we're communicating all the time, whether we know it or not, whether we're saying anything or not. Who said it? Well. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, yeah, who you are speaks so loudly I can hardly hear you talking because you're always expressing yourself to other people, even if you're not talking. So important. Yeah, absolutely. So crazy. And uh, this conditioning, neuroassociative conditioning, I, and I use that too because I saw that also in, in my ghetto cop work because Tony Robbins told a story where he was waiting in line at a hotel 
And uh, he was, I mean, he was getting really frustrated and, uh, you know, mad. And so by the time he got to the clerk, he, 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 he told the clerk, oh, man, like he said, I'm sorry you had to wait so long. And he says, yeah, God, I'm, I'm, I'm really peeved right now. And, and, the, and the clerk laughed. So peeved was such a soft word. Some of these words, we have a strong emotional connection word connection to that people will use that to get themselves in a like they would use this in like in the ghetto to get in, get ready to fight. Right. Because they would say strong words, you know, strong curse words that would get them getting ready to. So they would have an emotional attachment to that. So if you can change your language, like you were saying, you're going to change your emotional attachment to that. It's powerful, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then on the other end, you know, there's people who um, just kind of become habituated in some ways to um, some of these words. And then when they're actually angry, they have nowhere to go. You know, right. There's no, oh, yeah. they, they have no way of expressing it because they've already exhausted the vocabulary in regular everyday life. Yeah. But language is very powerful. Yeah. Language. Well, you know, they say that a lot of people, since they didn't have any more words to express how, how they were feeling, that's when they resorted to physical violence because they didn't have anything more to say. So by expanding your vocabulary and your thought processes, you can actually bring down your level where you would ever have to resort to uh, violence. They studied this with a lot of prisoners. And, and so language, so important, man. It's so great, so, man. Uh, so what do you want to do with your degree when you get your doctorate degree? Where are you going to, what are you going to do, Joel? Are you going to, you can have a therapy business or what are you, what are you going to do, man? I'll probably start studying something else. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe physics. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we'll see. No, I have, honestly, I have no plans to do anything um, different. I, I love my job uh, and my job pays more than most careers in psychology do. What is your so, job? Um, what is your job? I'm the production manager for a manufacturing facility. We make um, uh, electrical pieces for the the grid. Oh, great! Okay. Yeah. So, um, I think of it. I but I think of the psychology degree is sort of like a, a retirement plan, right? You know, I, yeah. I, I, I want to teach some classes part time. Uh, you know, because I I don't plan on ever actually retiring, but someday when I don't want to work full time, uh, I'll teach some classes until I keel over. I'll never retire. You know, I'm, I'm like you. I'm like you. I, I, you I, you're you like a kindred spirit to me, right? Because I, uh, a year and a half ago, because some guy here had it, I go, he got his captain's license. And so when I was in Florida, I think, I'm going to get my captain's license because I got a lot of time on the water here in upstate New York. I, I'm on the St. Lawrence River. You know where that is, Thousand Islands. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm from I'm on an island. So, so I went and got my captain's license, and it was very challenging. I got the six-pack. It's very easy to get. Well, not I say it's easy, but there was a navigation portion that was very difficult. But, you know, people were like, uh, why are you doing that? Are you going to be a captain? Well, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'm, it's something I want. I get hooked on achieving things, and I think you do too, right? It's, yeah. You can yeah, always it's learn, the, you can always learn something. from. I don't care if you're digging a ditch. Yeah. You can learn something from just watching or talking to people. I don't care what it is. You can learn something from it. Right. Yeah. And that's, it's not the achievement portion of it. That's important. It's, it's the journey of it. But ultimately, if, if, if your journey is taking you to always learn things and always to work at things, and if you're always giving stuff 110%, you'll kind of inevitably achieve things. Yes. So, yeah, it's kind of the- Have you ever listened to Jim Rohn? He was a, he was a business guy in the seventies. Yeah. 70s. yeah. So, so uh, he said, you know, set a goal to be a millionaire, not for the money, but for what you will become in attaining it, right? It's more important in becoming and not in getting. So just set these, set these achievement goals, uh, even if you don't achieve it. Like you said, it's the journey. It's, in, it's on the way that you're going to be learning all these things. And uh, you know what I learned was in, when, I was in, when I was disgruntled in my police job and went searching for something else. The first concept that I learned was learn to enjoy what you're doing while you pursue what you want. And man, when I did that, you know, you can, the choice, the happy is choice. And so you can be happy where you're at right now, right today, even though you have another destination in mind. And that just opens doors for you. That's unbelievable. Yeah. You really have to be right. Because if you're only achievement oriented, right. 
then you've sort of gamified life. And the problem with that is that, yeah, at the end of a football game, right, whoever wins gets to celebrate. But the end of life, when the clock runs out, that's it. You're done, right? So you have to enjoy playing the game. Right? Yeah, You have to enjoy that's whatever right. it is you're doing. You know, your time is you're not you're not going to get any of it back. So spending any of it disgruntled is is a waste. I know. Um, it. And, it, you know, there's there's plenty of people who have been in difficult situations that have found ways to um, even if they can't enjoy it, make it meaningful, you know, make, you know, find ways to, to live a fulfilling life. And, uh, you know, I think that that's that's our duty. Right. That's that's our, that's our duty. Our I like that. Somebody said I forgot it was. Oh, it was Grant Cardone, a real estate guy. Success is my duty. That's why I do it. You know, it's funny because I, I, I talk to these guys and it's been, you know, I was talking to a couple of retired officers now who are doing studies and they, you know, they come to find out that, you know, more cops were dying of suicide than in the line of duty deaths. And so they were taking their lives in greater numbers. And so, man, sometimes I'm looking at these guys and they have podcasts and I think, you know, they got PTSD and they're really talking about it and all the things. I think, well, I've seen all these things. I saw some hellacious things. So maybe I should be more depressed, you know, but I'm thinking I'm not going to go there, man, because I've habituated controlling my emotions and not that we're, you know, unfeeling. I'm very feeling. I, you know, I cry at commercials, but I, I've, I, I, I've learned to try to habituate controlling my state. Not that I don't get sad or down as we all do, but I've learned to kind of, you know, I'm not going to linger there too long without taking some actions to counteract that. So I've habituated that mindset. I'm more, I know the default is kind of negative as a survival technique. And so I override that because there's no dinosaur out there. And so I don't need to be fearing that. Yeah, you know, and that's, again, uh, a lot of the principles of, of, you know, Buddhism, Zen Buddhism in particular, right, is uh, that the, the worst thing you can do is become attached, right? Yes. And oh, whether yeah. it's good or bad things, right? That's right. If you become attached to your negative emotions, then they just feed back into themselves. If you become attached to your positive emotions, then the second you run into an obstacle yes. or a setback, everything's out the window, right? You have to think of each moment as being its own thing. Right. And you have to think of your whole life as, as being what you're doing right now, you know, and you have to find ways to make it meaningful and to enjoy it the best you can. I think all of these, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, Tao Te Chang and all these Asian, all these in, in Zen Buddha and all the, and even biblically, right. If you, if we read like Paul writes, you know, the Philippines, right. Uh, in Philippi, he's, he's writing from prison, right. And he's saying, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. And he says, I repeat this, rejoice in the Lord. You know, don't cast your worries on God. Let him take care of it. He transcends all understanding and let him guard your heart and your mind because uh, it, this worry will not add one minute to your life, right? And so focus, whatever is good, whatever is great, whatever is beautiful, focus on these things. And so I think you can take these as a guide. I just like these things because... I found Joel, so I like, you know, all these motivational people and gurus that I, that I really like and I've followed. I always like to research, oh, where did they get that from? And I've kind of gone all the way back to like to 2,000 years ago. Oh, shoot, Marcus Aurelius said that. Oh, my God. You know, actually, Paul said that in the Bible. And these guys, not that there's anything wrong with what they're saying, but it actually goes back, you know, two, 3,000 years that these things, you know, and they become cliches because they're true, right? I'm getting excited just talking about it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, and that's that's the thing is, you know, Paul in that case, right? Paul is on his way to Rome to get executed. And he yeah, knows it. he knows you know, that's what's happening. He's saying he this. Knows, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. And, yeah. And so, and in, you know, Stoicism, you know, Marcus really, so a lot of people have this sort of distorted view of Stoicism as as being um, a denial of your emotions, but it's not. It's exactly what you just mentioned, yep. which is, oh, yeah. it's a recognition of your emotions. It's an acceptance of your emotions, but then it's the... Uh, resilience and persistence yes. to move beyond them and, and uh, you know, get on with your life. I studied stoicism so intently for so long. Ryan Holiday, I don't know if you ever followed him, but he's wrote several books on stoicism. He speaks to football teams and places around the, around the world really on it. And then he just explained. So people, yeah, stoicism, people think, oh, he's stoic. You know, he's, the, he, the, he would describe that as small as stoicism and large as stoicism was really, and then some people attribute, they attribute uh, Marcus Aurelius to the start of Stoicism when he wasn't. It was really, it was Zeno who was, you know, he crashed, he was a rich merchant, right? He crashed the ship and he finds himself in this bookstore in Greece and he, he stumbles onto this philosophy. Where can I find these philosophers? And well, there's one right there. And then 
he kind of gathered with these people in the uh, Stoa Palike or whatever. It's the, the painted porch is what it means, but really, and, and so it was a place, the Stoa Palike, I think they would pronounce it. But So then it became Stoicism because they would gather out in the open and have open discussions and people could hear it. And so then Epictetus, who had been a slave and he became a philosopher, he had a lot of writings came from his lectures. He didn't write himself, but a student wrote it. And then Marcus Aurelius would quote these in his meditations, but he, he, he learned from there. So actually, Stoicism started in, in, in Greece. It got transferred over into uh, Rome, and then Marcus Aurelius picked up on this. Yeah, but uh, it's really good yeah, stuff. And, yeah, yeah, and Epictetus. Yeah, Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. I mean, that highlights the fact that it works for anybody, right? That's because, what I. Th- yeah, like because said, this Epictetus, guy, you got an emperor. You got an emperor who had everything. He could have all the sex he wanted, all the power he wanted, all these things. He's at the front lines of a war, and yet he is sitting down with private thoughts to himself that wasn't ever meant to be published, and he's thinking the same things that you and I think at night. And I just find that fascinating because he wasn't writing for anybody to read that. He was thinking to himself. And yet he had a plague going on. People were dying in the streets of Rome. He had a war going on. But yet in his private thoughts, he's thinking, you know, who am I most thankful for? What am I? And, and so these thoughts are just, yeah, you know, like you say. And then Epictetus was a slave who, who won his freedom. And then he studied these, these philosophies. And, he, and so you got two ends of the spectrum there. And so I, it, it is fascinating. But I want to be respectful of your time. Will you come together with me again and join me on another podcast? Absolutely, yeah, anytime. What's the name of your podcast? I want to have. I'm going to check yours out because at night I listen to podcasts, and, I, and when I'm on the treadmill, I listen to podcasts. Sure, yeah. So it's uh, from nowhere to nothing, um, and what we do it's a philosophy podcast, and usually our format is to take one word or two words, and we'll talk about it for an hour. Um, so we start by looking at. Um, sort of historical thought philosophers have had on the topic throughout time. And then uh, me and my resident expert, my old philosophy professor, will uh, sort of talk about how we feel about that, given the context of history. And then towards the end, we'll ask kind of speculative questions, right? Based upon the things we've we've talked about, what are the implications for ourselves and for humanity and that sort of thing? Man, I love it. So, I'll, anytime you want a guest, I'll come on your podcast because I love that stuff. If you need a police point of view or whatever, but yeah, I just, yeah, absolutely. I just so, love uh, these things. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. Yeah. You're obviously confident. You've thought about a lot of philosophy and stuff. So if you ever want to come on, we can either talk about your life or you can pick one word and we can go through it the same way that we do on the regular show. But I, yeah, I'd love to have you on. Oh, I love that. I love that, Joel. And man, keep doing what you're doing. Always be learning. You know, I, I, uh, I just graduated from a, it's called the Primal Health Coach Institute. It's, it's a guy, Mark Sisson. He, he's like in his 70s and he's jack. He's, man, he's just unbelievable. But he has like 10 laws of, of health, right? So he believes in these 10 things, right? Eat meat, fish, fowl, eggs, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds. Stay away from grains, sugars, and chemically altered oils. Move a lot throughout the day, right? Do a lot of movement. Uh, every once in a while, lift heavy things. He does some, you know, deadlifting with a hex bar. And then every seven to day, seven to ten days, he sprints. Uh, get plenty of sleep. Play at something. He plays ultimate frisbee. Uh, get plenty of sunlight. Uh, don't do stupid things. You know, don't text and drive. Don't do things that'll get you killed or injured. And ten is always be learning, learning an ins- instrument, learning a language, bending the brain, and expanding your thinking. I think you're doing all those things, my brother. Yeah, yeah, I am, including the sprinting. I, I was sprinting outside for the first time. What? You're uh, doing that? That's great. Yeah, I didn't know, but so apparently it promotes all these human growth hormone and testosterone. And yeah. Yeah, no, really. And that's, that's you know, an interesting aspect of it is when you look at just how much it promotes uh, human growth hormone and testosterone and stuff, um, it, it's really sort of, you know, this uh, this wake-up call that, hey, um, you have to, you have to push yourself to the max. Right. Yeah. And I think that that goes physically as well as, uh, psychologically and creatively and, and spiritually, right. You should always be, you know, not all the time, but, uh, you, you need to push yourself to all the way to see what you can do, um, regularly. Yes. In you order have to, to. In yeah. Order to stay, stay healthy. That's right. Yes. Not every day should be a, 
you know, a personal performance record day, but every once in a while, push yourself to see, and then that training in route there, you're going to see the benefits going in a, in a regulated way. You'll see how that benefits. Matter of fact, he started training. This guy used to train triathletes and, and he was in several triathlons, but he had physical ailments. And then when he got into this new way of eating and he calls it primal, but, uh, you know, and so we can talk about that in another podcast, but then, so Brad Kearns was a big guy. He trained in triathletes when he, so when he told that guy to back off on his training, you know, he wanted no part of that, you know, and he wanted to get him off that carbohydrate glucose roller coaster. He wanted no part of it. And so when the guy retired and started doing what he told him to do, all of a sudden his time, it just it got faster and faster. He trained less, got a lot faster. And he goes, oh man, what you've been telling me for the last five years is what I should have been listening to. Yeah. You know, I, if, if you're willing to put in a little bit of work, life isn't, isn't that hard, you know, no. and, and that's and incremental improvements, right? I remember 10 years ago when I started my job, you know, eat on my lunch break, looking in my lunch and seeing two bags of little chips and some little Debbie snacks. And I thought, what am I doing? You know, I'm a full grown man. Yeah. Like I take better care of myself and, uh, you know, just by changing one thing, you know, one thing. And then once you're used to that and once you enjoy it, change another thing. And once you're used to that and you enjoy it and just kind of the incremental Absolutely. Progress, incremental, s- small steps. You know, and people say to me all the time is because I, you know, I, I, I only post my workout videos and things I, that I, you know, I'm working out here on the dock and I jump rope and lifting weights. You know, I only do that to show that I walk the talk when I'm not just talking out my ass. I'm actually doing these things. But, you know, people, I'm not going to be working out two hours a day. And I go, listen, I only work when I'm doing my strength training. Like uh, when I'm in the gym, I'm in there for like 30 minutes, maybe 35. I'm not spending two hours a day, but I'm consistent. But I'm not there. I mean, you know, I may only do that three days a week, but I'm consistent with it. Yeah. And that's what I that's what I tell a lot of people, too, is, you know, uh, you know, and again, I, I do it for fitness sake, right? Like I'm not trying to be, uh, in, you know, big or anything. Um, but people will, will ask me, how do you stay in such good shape? I go, I never work out more than 25 minutes. A nope. Day, that's me. Know? Yep. But, but you know, I haven't missed a day in 25 years. So now one know, thing I did like, start doing with, uh, Mark Sisson's philosophies for health, because I found myself in this pattern. I did my workout. You know, maybe I do some cardio. So I was 40, 45 minutes and then I'm inside, got my workout done. And that now I realize, no, 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 no. You, you know, do 25, 30 minutes. And then I need to do some other things. Maybe stand up paddleboard here do a little swimming. Keep moving throughout the day. The move mean move a lot is important. Yes, yes, absolutely. Because um, actually the, the sort of capstone project I did for my last course was looking at um, obesity in older people. And yeah. one interesting finding I found from doing that study was that active exercise does not counteract sedentary behavior. No, it doesn't. So no. even if even if you work out, if the rest of the time you're sitting down, you're not doing anything, it's not going to help you. You have to be active throughout your day, right? So yeah. yeah, same thing. You know, I've got stairs in my house. Every time I go up the stairs, I sprint as fast as I can, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. And that it's, it's a little stuff like that, right? If you can if you can stand up or ride your stationary bike while you're watching TV or, or whatever, those little things really add up. Well, you know, that's, that's what keeps you healthy for the long haul. So my mom, my mom's 88. She was, when she was here last week, she's on the treadmill. She, it was raining. She, and I got to do my workout cause you inspired me. So she was out there. She did three and a half miles. And so she has, she has two rails for her basement. But, you know, I, I would hear friends, oh, you, you shouldn't have your mother going up and down those stairs. Are you kidding me? I think that keeps her young. She goes up and down those stairs probably 10 times a day doing laundry, going down to her treadmill. And so, I mean, she's unbel- compared to some of her cohorts that are the same age or, well, most of them had died, but they're, most of them are in their mentality. Oh, what good? Why would we do that at our age? What good does it do? And, I mean, and she's like, why do they have this mentality? <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, and some of, yeah. Some of that um, is due to um, conditions, you know, conditioned. Of, yeah, conditioning, and also, um, you know, there's been some bad medical advice in the past. You know, what oh, they're yeah. finding now is that, hey, if your knees are bad, the best thing you can do is to continue to work out. You know, and a lot of people go, oh, well, now I'm going to take it easy, and then you just never get back to doing what you were doing, and things continue to deteriorate. 
um, they're finding now that actually that shock to the cartilage in your knee from from just walking, just doing regular activity, actually builds it back up. That's correct. So, you are yeah, right on. You know, yeah. Well, listen, let's get together yeah, again. So I'm going to have you on again. We're going to talk about physical fitness and all that stuff because I'm into that. And I see that you are too, and it's so important for longevity. I'm into that. Not too many people are really into it because I was listening to a doctor today because the mortality rate for somebody 50 and younger is so low that nobody's really conscious of it. But you get 50, 60 above, it becomes more of uh, something in your mind. So, But you're already there, brother, and you're doing the right thing. So I want to be con- uh, respectful of your time. I'm going to push people to your uh, website and your, your uh, from nowhere to nothing. Yep. No. Tim, from nowhere to no, from nowhere to nothing. That's your podcast. Yeah, from nowhere to nothing. All right, I'm gonna send people there, and I'm gonna go there. I'll subscribe, my brother, and I will pass it on to other people. I can't wait to hear the philosophical conversations that you had. Cool. All right, brother, hang yeah, around for a little debriefing, my brother. This was Joel Bouchard. Joel, All thank right. you, my brother. Everybody else, you know, subscribe to the channel if you're watching or listening on YouTube because it tells the computer people are interacting. Leave a comment; they'll show it to more people. And then you'll play a part in positively impacting somebody else. Why not be a part of the team? All right, I'll see you on the next episode.